I am Anna Seewald and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm, connection and joint parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. I'm a parent educator and my mission is to help children by helping parents. The motto of this podcast is raising our children, growing ourselves. Today, joyful parenting through astrology. Have you ever considered looking into astrology for parenting advice or insight? Well, after today's conversation, you might be just a little more curious and open-minded. Or maybe not. Maybe you are a skeptic. In any case, I thought I'd offer you a different kind of episode, a deviation from our usual parenting talk. How can learning about your child's horoscope guide you in terms of education, discipline, screen time, extracurricular activities, understanding their personality, and supporting them? Well, my guest, Brianna Saucy, says that astrology can give us flexible, playful, and more profound information than other schematics and typologies, and it can support parents with new insights into their children. Brianna Saucy is a teacher, storyteller, spiritual counselor, astrologer, and founder of the Sacred Arts Academy where she teaches divination, ceremony, magic, and other sacred arts for everyday life. She's the author of Making Magic, weaving together the everyday and the extraordinary. And her new book, Star Child, Joyful Parenting Through Astrology. What stories do the stars tell about our children? Every person alive is born under a particular snapshot of the celestial relationships occurring at the time of their birth. The picture, known as a natal chart, offers a powerful tool for insight into your children's strengths, struggles, hopes, and dreams. Help your child make the most of their unique gifts, challenges, and potentials with a guide to parenting by the stars. Please enjoy this somewhat unusual episode with Brianna Sosi and definitely check out her book, Star Child, if you want to explore further. It's a beautiful book filled with lots of stories, very informative, has activities and rituals, including rituals for your inner child. Well, Brianna, I just want to welcome you to the show. Hello and nice to meet you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, Anna. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I love the book cover, Star Child, Joyful Parenting Through Astrology. I I think my audience may think that I'm going a little woo-woo and a little (laughs) to a, a whole different location. But, you know, when I was a teenager, young teenager, as my daughter is now, she's 13, I was very interested in astrology. I studied everything that I could. I pretended I was a medium and a psychic. <laughs> I did have some like intuition and abilities like this. I would do all sorts of mind experiments. So I love this, this topic. I even recently went to a psychic. So I don't know what my audience thinks about me. They didn't know maybe about this part <laughs> about me. But, you know, my daughter is interested in astrology too. So I think it's becoming popular again, or maybe it was always popular. I just lost touch. But tell me about your journey. What made you write this book, first and foremost? So I grew up in a family where magic and things like divination and astrology were practiced, but we also didn't make a big deal about them, right? It was just kind of like part of the stuff that you did. 
And my family is informed by a couple of different magical traditions. And so I grew up steeped in that, did very well in school, went off to college and studied classics and philosophy, but always kept my interest in divination and astrology and magic alive and, you know, cast charts for my friends in college. And so when I started in 2009, working full-time within the sacred arts, which is what I, the term that I use to describe things like divination and astrology and magic, I very quickly found that astrology was just naturally getting brought into my practice. You know, people wanted to know about timing. People wanted to know about, you know, am I going to get along with this potential partner or not? And then as I had my children, I had more and more questions from parents. Like, do I, you know, what do I need to know about getting along well with my child who's this sign and I'm this sign? And like, I read something and it said that we'll never get along and I'm freaking out about it, right? So it really went from, you know, it was a very natural progression, I guess you could say. And when I wrote my first book, Making Magic, I did not know, and if you had told me in the writing of that book that my second book would be about parenting and astrology, I would have looked at you, you know, like you had a second head. But this book really came to me, and it was very clear that it needed to be written. And I very much went into it with the attitude of, I'm going to write this book whether I have a publisher for it or not, like I need this book and I have so many parent friends that need this book and Sounds True, who had published my first book, stepped forward and they are an amazing publisher and I love them so much and they were very excited about the book and so we took it and we ran with it. And, you know, this is a book that immediately people, our publication day was yesterday, was July 20th and so people, are already messaged me and they've said, thank you so much. This is exactly what I needed. I needed to have a way to language the conflicts and the joys that I have with my kids. And this is really helping me do that. So that's my hope for it. I want it to be of help. I want it to be supportive to everyone who's a parent and everyone who has children that they know and they love and they're taking care of. Yeah. And you yourself, you have two children, right? I do. I have a 10-year-old boy who is a Pisces and I have a three-year-old boy who is a Gemini. Oh, I'm a Gemini. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the best sign. <laughs> yes. Gemini. I love Geminis because they're like, this is the most awesome sign. It's too bad that you're not a Gemini. <laughs> <laughs> yes it, it depends who you ask everybody thinks their sign is the best right it's true it's true yeah you know but I was more of a Gemini when I was younger mm-hmm. now I think I'm more um stable in my traits, I guess. I was fitting into the description better when I was younger and I enjoyed that. So I have an Aries child. It's a fire sign. How about we take my daughter and my parenting as an example, you know, Gemini mother, uh, Aries daughter, and and you detail uh, quite a lot in 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 this book about their strengths, about athletics, about academics, and my daughter fits quite well with the with the descriptions, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And it's good to know certain things because we always have our own ideas about our children, but when you discover this new angle that she's more sporty and athletic. And I knew that about her Mm -hmm. Uh, for me to pause and say, okay, I'm not going to push, let's say arts and crafts or something that she's not into. It gives you a little bit of comfort, right? Because we always have agendas for our kids, regardless of who we have as a kid, we have this path trajectory and, and we want them to do a certain way. So And each chapter of your book begins with a story. So why don't you tell me, like, what was the thinking behind this? How did you put this together for each sign? And we can use an example to give the listener 
you know, what are we talking about here? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, the first thing that I want to say, I want to I want to circle back to something that you said, which is one of the motivations in writing Star Child and in working with astrology to have a deep, loving relationship with our children is exactly what you said. It can sometimes be really difficult. I think especially as they're younger, when they're younger, to see our children in and of themselves, that they have their own preferences, their own likes, their own dislikes, their own desires that may or may not be the way that we are. You know, they they may or may not be reflections of, of what we think and how we go through the world. And normally there's going to be overlap, of course, because you're her, her mother. But then there's also going to be places where she really is, is her own person. And I think that astrology, when it's worked with uh, correctly, can really help unfold that for us. So I think that example that you used of like, you know, she's an athletically gifted child. Now, maybe your preference is more for like academics or arts, but like if this is her area of giftedness, let's see it and honor it and support it, right? So in each chapter, I begin with a story, and the stories are taken from around the world. So we're going to have European fairy tales. We have some Native American stories. We have a story from indigenous Mexico. We have stories from Russia and China and Japan. And so I've, I've sourced these stories from around the world. And the idea is that, first of all, you can share the story with your child. I am a story storyteller and I'm a huge believer in story as a language that we all have in common. And the second idea behind including the stories is that each of the stories illustrates a quality or a set of qualities that really speaks to that particular sign. So for Aries, the story is Jack and the Beanstalk. And there's a lot of elements of Jack and the Beanstalk that speak to Aries children by and large. So Jack is physically gifted. He's agile. He's climbing the beanstalk up and down, up and down. He is impetuous, right? He doesn't really think about the idea of selling the cow for some beans or like how his mom is going to react to that. He just, he goes for it. And that's a very Aries, you know, Aries are sometimes called impatient and they can be, but the other side of that is they're spontaneous and they, they go with with what's in front of them. And that can be a very good thing. You know, Aries, children and, and adults often tend to be able to be in the moment in a really good way. So, you know, a lot of times for your listeners who are Aries or you have Aries children, you may have heard like, oh, you're so impatient. And yeah, right, you might be. But the other part of that is you're very present in the moment. So the guy comes up, he's got these magic beans and Jack is like, I'm in, let's do this, right? Very Aries. He wants to be the hero. He wants to be the protector. This is an element of Aries that I feel isn't discussed enough, but Aries children and adults have a desire to protect. They have a desire to defend. They often are the ones who are going to stand up for people or for causes that need a champion. Those roles, the role of the champion, the warrior, the hero, those are roles that they really resonate with. Often Aries children, and you see this when they're very little, are drawn to like military or martial themes. Like they like camouflage. They like soldiers. There's a discipline in the martial arts that speaks to them. So that's another area where, you know, you may may be like, wow, no one in our family has served in any of the armed forces. And we have this child who's like all about the military. Where did that come from? Often that's a trait that we find in Aries. And they're passionate and they're very, very bright. And Jack is very bright. He thinks quickly on his feet and he 
is, you know, very agile. He moves very quickly. And those are very Aries-like qualities. And so that's why Jack and the Beanstalk was a great story to work with to illustrate some of those essential qualities of Aries. And where, where is that story come from? Is this American story? Jack and the Beanstalk is a European story. And I forget, I'll have to look in the book, but there's English variants and there's Irish variants of it. But I think it might be, I think some of the oldest variants might be even before England and Ireland. Mm. So there, it's a, it's a very, very old story. Uh, and what's your sign? My sign is Libra. So I'm the opposite of an Aries. And my dad is an Aries and my grandmother is an Aries and my sister is an Aries. So I am I am a Libra. And that's another element that I bring into the book is looking at the polarity. That's the sign that's the opposite because those two signs always have a lot to teach one another. They have a lot to share with one another. They complement each other really well. Oh, I see. So uh, here is a silly question. Did you plan your children to be a harmonious sign with your sign or no? No. And you know, that's not a silly question. I was actually talking to a friend of mine last night and she was saying she did plan her children to be like, she had ideas about what she wanted her kids to be. I did not at all, but we have a very nice balance in our household. My husband is a Pisces and my oldest is a Pisces. I'm a Libra. My youngest is a Gemini. So we have two air signs and we have two water signs. So we balance nicely. Yeah. And you're, you're a Gemini and Gemini and Aries often can, you know, they can stir each other up, but on a really fundamental level, you guys understand one another. You really do get each other and air and fire. Traditionally, those are the elements that are involved. They work very well together. Yeah. The fire needs air, right? To burn more. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. And, and the, and the air needs fire to sort of illuminate like air signs. We air signs, cause I'm an air sign as well. We can be so in our head and our ideas that fire reminds us to like show up and to be visible and to and to look and not just think. Yeah. So for someone who doesn't have basic knowledge or interest or understanding of, of astrology, could you quickly maybe give a brief description? How many signs are there? How many like the water? Uh, I don't know what these are called in English. I, I, I know it in my language. Like a, a brief overview of what are we talking about here, you know? Yes, absolutely. So I think, first of all, for those of you who are new to astrology, if you purchase my book, I do have a pretty good primer at the beginning that will set you up well. And I've heard this, I mean, I wrote it to be that way, but I've had, I've, it has been confirmed by fellow astrologers that I know. They're like, oh, this is actually really good introductory material if you don't know anything about astrology. So that's number one. Number two is that astrology is one of those things that if you go like Google it, you are going to get overwhelmed very, very quickly. So just understand that this is a several thousand year old sacred art. There's been a lot written about it. There's been a lot said about it. It can get very complicated, but the basics are not. So we start with the stars and you can go outside tonight and you can look at them. And that's the most beautiful way to begin your astrological learning, right? And then we, we work with what's called a natal chart. And a natal chart is basically a snapshot of the sky at the time that something occurs. So the most traditional kind of natal chart is what the sky looked like at the time of someone's birth. And you might hear that referred to as a birth chart. But you can also cast a chart for like the beginning of a business or the beginning of a podcast or a marriage, right? Like there are lots of different reasons to cast a chart, but the most typical is when someone is born. So the picture of the sky is going to have a few things in it 
no matter what. The first thing it's going to have, it's typically going to look like a circle and it's going to have the 12 zodiacal signs. These are also sometimes referred to as the 12 sun signs. So when I tell someone I'm a Libra, what I'm telling them is that the sun was in Libra at the time of my birth, right? That means that I was born somewhere from mid-September to mid-October. That's the time of year that the sun is in Libra. For our Geminis, mid-May to mid-June, right? And your, your birthday is going to fall somewhere in that period of time. That's when the sun is in Gemini. So there's 12 zodiac signs. These are constellations that are in the sky. And depending on where you live and the time of year, you can find them or you can find some of them. We begin with Aries, the ram. Taurus is the second sign, and that's the bull. Then we have Gemini. Gemini <laughs> is the twins. We then have Cancer, the crab also sometimes uh, referred to as a scarab beetle, but the crab is the most common. We then have Leo, the lion, that's our fifth sign. The sixth sign is, virgin, is Virgo. Virgo is represented by the virgin or the sovereign, often depicted as like a goddess of abundance. She may have a sheaf of wheat in her hands. We then have the seventh sign of Libra. Libra is the only sign that's not represented by an animal or a person. It's represented by the symbol of the scales or a balance. Then the eighth house, you know, the eighth sign gives us Scorpio followed by Sagittarius, the archer, the centaur, Capricorn. I'm, yeah, Capricorn is the sea goat. Sometimes Capricorn is referred to as the goat, but it traditionally, mythologically, it's a sea goat. So it's one part goat, one part fish, kind of like a mer goat, if you will. Aquarius is represented by the human, the man, or sometimes an angel. And then we have Pisces, who is represented as the fish. So those are the 12 zodiacal signs. As I said, when you tell someone what your sun sign is, that's what you're referring to. The sun was in one of those signs. Those 12 signs map onto 12 sections of the chart. If you think of the chart as a pie, the pie is broken up into 12 slices. And each of those slices is referred to as a house. So we have houses one through 12, and they map onto the signs. So the houses really represent different areas of life. And I won't go through them all, but just to give you a flavor, the first house, which is naturally ruled by Aries, has to do with your identity. It has to do with, you know, this is who I am, and here I am. It has to do with the kinds of first impressions that you make and the way that you start projects and also perhaps the way that you end or don't end projects that you begin. It has to do with how you enter a room and it has to do also with what you're here for, what it is, like what's your, people say, what's your big why? The Greek word, the ancient Greek word is telos, like for the sake of which, why are you doing what it is that you're doing? The seventh house, to use the polarity of Aries Libra, has to do with relationships. At that point in the chart, we start looking at not just me, but me in relationship to other people, to love, to romance, to children, to work, to money, right? All of these things. And so the houses speak to different areas of life. The signs all have specific qualities. And depending on what sign you're born under, you will have some of those qualities. Usually not all of them. You know, I've, I've said in the interviews I've done for Star Child, I've said it's very possible that you will read a chapter for your child's sun sign and say, mm, some of this is right, but some of this really doesn't resonate. And that's because we have a couple of other important points in the chart. The sign your moon is in at the time of your birth and also what's called your ascendant matter a lot. And I get into detail about what those are. But all you really need to know to start is 12 zodiac signs, 12 houses, 
or as I said, sections of the chart. And then there are the planets. So we have the sun and the moon are both considered planets in classical astrology. And then we have Mercury, Venus, and Mars. We have Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto is also considered a planet in astrology. And those planets, Earth, of course, is where we are. So Earth is not really represented because we're looking at all of this from Earth. And those planets are all going to be in your chart. They will, they will be in different places depending on the time that you're born, but they're all there. They're all represented. And each of the planets has a whole set of gifts and a whole set of challenges that it brings. And so depending on your relationship with each of those planets, that's going to give you a lot of information about what comes easy and what maybe you have to work harder for, what are areas to naturally support yourself or your children, what are areas that are going to be more of a challenge to navigate. And, and there is the four, um, the water, the fire, the earth, and the air. What are That's those right. called? So the four elements, elements also. Elements. Yeah, the yeah, four okay. elements also show up. And so we have three, we basically have four sets of three. So you have three fire signs. Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. And each one of those signs is going to have a quality. They're going to be cardinal. That's Aries. That means like they're the ones that take charge. They're the leaders. Then you're going to have a fixed sign. That's Leo in the case of fire. And those are the people that are, they are thorough. They get the job done. They, they go forward and they toil one foot in front of the other. They're very consistent. They're usually very loyal and they see something through to the end. And then you're going to have your mutable signs. So for fire, that's Sagittarius. Those are the ones, they're like the connective tissue of the Zodiac. So they connect people, they network people, they offer often set up things and then they don't get credit for it. And so with our mutable signs, both of my children are mutable. It's really important with our mutable signs to acknowledge the work that they do behind the scenes to make something happen because they do a lot of work behind the scenes. And, you know, you've got the cardinal signs like me, I'm a Libra, um, or your Aries who are like, let us tell you all about it. And you've got your fixed signs who are like, I'm working really hard to make this happen. In, and your mutable signs are just connecting everything and making everything possible. And they, they sometimes are not seen. So I always say we want to make sure that we appreciate our mutable signs. That includes our Gemini friends. <laughs> oh, really? I was going to ask you from your description. I was trying to figure out which one am I? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a mutable sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mutable signs are also very like they go with the flow. It's like, true, whatever <laughs> needs to happen, like they're adaptable, they're flexible. Cardinal signs can be really bossy and fixed signs can be very, they can have tunnel vision and inflexible. Like once they've decided, that's it. Whereas mutable signs, you know, what they have to work on is like boundaries and, and actually saying, well, no, I don't have time for that. Or no, that's not going to work for me. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. How about the Pisces? What kind of uh, sign is, is it mutable? Is it uh, cardinal? What is it? It's a mutable sign. It's yeah. It's a mutable sign. So for air, you have your Gemini is mutable, your Libra is cardinal, and your Aquarius is fixed. For Earth, your Taurus is fixed. Oh, I know a few Tauruses. Yes, they are and they're very fixed. fixed. They're very they fixed, right? Yes. Your yes. Virgo is mutable. It's adaptable. Very, it's very adaptable, very, right? And, yeah. and Virgo and Gemini usually have a good relationship because both of those signs are ruled by the planet Mercury. So like they often have, you know, like a, a little ping connection with one another. And then your Capricorns are the cardinal earth sign. And then for water, 
Cancer is the cardinal water sign. Scorpio, unsurprisingly, is the fixed sign, right? They're, they're fixed. They know. And then Pisces is the mutable sign. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I, I am very best friends with Virgos. I have many, many friends and I know a lot of people actually who are Virgos. I don't know. Is there statistics like what sign it is, it has, has a, a lot of people are born like in September. I know. Is it a coincidence or there is some truth to this statistically speaking? You know, that's a really good question. And I think that there are, I do think that we have typically more babies born at, at different times of the year. And I do think autumn babies tend to be, there tend to be more babies in the autumn, but there are, and there are definitely, you will notice as you start to pay attention to astrology, you will notice like, I really get along with these people, you know, I like, I have a lot of Virgos in my life and I don't have Virgo is not like, it's not my sun sign. It's not my moon sign. It's not my ascendant, but my Venus is in Virgo. So I love Virgos. Like they're organized, they're thoughtful, they're mature. They do a beautiful job with whatever it is that they're doing. I love, and I admire those qualities. And so, yes, you'll start to notice, like, I really mesh well with this kind of a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely noticed that. So what can we say if we, uh, I opened the chapter on Aries. First, you go into Aries personality, which we already talked about a little bit. Then you talk about academics, physical yes. activity, arts and creativity, extracurricular activities, technology, sleeping and waking, how best to connect, and a bunch of other things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you provide those categories for each sign, correct? In That's the correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So after how best to connect, I give you the polarity. That again is going to be like the sign opposite. So for Aries, it's Libra. And it's going to talk about how those two signs complement one another, what they can learn from each other, and also, you know, what they need to remember, what each one teaches the other. Then I talk about the ascendant. So let's say that your child is not a Gemini, but they have Gemini as their ascendant. That's the star sign that's rising over the horizon. It's ascending over the horizon at the time of your birth. So I have a little section on that. And then their moon. The moon is a really useful thing to look at because it talks about the relationship with mom. It talks about the relationship with home and with comfort and comfort zones. So, you know, that's useful information for a parent to have. Like, what makes my child feel comfortable? What doesn't make my child feel comfortable? What do I need to know about, about what relaxes them and allows them to feel safe? Yeah. So what can I learn about my child and treat her <laughs> differently, you know, ac according to the to astrology in terms of academics, for example? So academics is a really good one to pick for Aries because one of the things that often happens with Aries kids or kids that have their moon in Aries or children that have their ascendant in Aries or those who just have a lot of Aries in their chart is they can get in trouble in school especially early on, like they, they tend to talk without thinking. Sometimes they're really loud. Sometimes they move around a lot. They fidget, you know, and, and the teacher is like, sit still, be quiet. And, you know, all of the like conventional classroom behaviors run counter to what the Aries child naturally wants to do. And so because of that, Early on, the Aries child can get a reputation for being like one of the bad kids or one of the problem kids. Like I know a lot of parents with Aries children and they were the ones that were getting like, you know, the behavior slips like started coming home really early on. And so it's important for parents of Aries children or Aries influenced children to understand that 
first of all, this behavior is part of their giftedness. Secondly, self-regulation and self-control is something that can be taught, but also doesn't really start to kick in according to most child psychology and psychologists, doesn't really start to kick in until we're about seven years old. That's where it begins. So like the early years with your Aries child, they're going to be rambunctious and that's part of their awesomeness like that's part of their giftedness you just may not see it when they're like three year olds and you're like can you just sit still for two seconds and so but they will learn how to self-regulate they will learn self-control it is something that you'll want to work on but how they're doing in school should be a separate a separate topic, right? Because Aries are often very, very smart. They can get into issues academically because they like to be the first ones who finish. So they're not as likely to like double check their work. So you want to make sure that they're encouraged to double check their work. Don't turn it. You know, you don't have to be the first one to finish. Double check your work. They can be very competitive. We have several signs that are natural, competitive people. And again, I don't think that should be punished or ignored. I think that should be channeled. So it's like, yes, when we play soccer, we're competitive. When we're doing the math test, like the competition is to get a good grade, not to be the first one to get done because you're going to make a mistake and you're not going to know it because you wanted to be the first one finished. Aries, they're not, they, they, as I said, they fidget and they're impetuous. And so they often need a classroom environment that moves very quickly. If they're told to like, just buckle down and focus on one thing for an hour, that's going to be very hard for an Aries child. They, they need more stimulus and they need more, they need more of a quick pace. And so teachers, you know, if you have an Aries child and you're like, oh my gosh, this is my child, you might want to talk to the teacher about, you know, what, what can we do to honor like the fact that, you know, there does need to be a faster pace for them. A lot of the time they're very smart and they get things really fast and then they're ready to move on. And another thing with Aries children, as is true with the other fire signs, is they are often show me, not tell me learners. So verbally, like for us air signs, we'll talk, we'll listen, we'll write, like we're happy and all of that stuff. But for my fire signs, they often need to see it and then they can do it. So things like math, right? Where you get into some abstract thinking pretty quickly. Like they need manipulatives. They need to like actually see how the equations are working or see how the fractions are working. And then it starts to make sense to them. So learning style is an important thing to look at across the board, whether we're talking about astrology or not. But I do believe that astrology can give us some good insight on learning styles and what learning styles really uh, work for different kinds of children. Do you use this kind of knowledge and insight in parenting your children or or often, how often, when you make connections? uh, Give me a good story if you have of of a mismatch or, or, or a good one that you really connected the dots and it helped you in some way. Oh, absolutely. Um, so my oldest, as I said, is a Pisces. And one of the one of the qualities of Pisces is they're sensitive, they're extremely thoughtful, and they're psychic. Like they just they just are. True. Yeah. And- my my mom was um sorry, my mom was Pisces and she did she was a psychic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, and, and they, 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 know. they are very sensitive and intuitive, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so as little children they need to be they need to be taught that the that their peers the other little kids that they're with are not going to be as sensitive they're not going to be as intuitive and they're not you know they're not going to understand that the Pisces child is so sensitive and so intuitive. So that can really help. Like if you have a Pisces child, uh, as I do, you know, knowing that can really help you language 
okay, you need to be aware of this. Like not all of your friends are thinking about it this carefully. Not all of your friends are this, are this sensitive. And so you just have to know that you're going to be missing them at certain times. And that's okay. I had one of the moments where I knew that I was going to write Star Child was when I went into my oldest child's like first parent teacher conference and you know, they were telling me how smart he is and how artistic he is and how kind he is, all very Pisces traits. And, and they said, you know, we just worry sometimes like that he has a harder time making friends. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I completely understood that because again, there's a lot of sensitivity, there's a lot of thought. And so social situations can be overwhelming for our little Piscean babies. And so I instead of getting worried about that, I was like, okay, you know, that I see that that is something that he will need support with. And I was also then able to ask the teachers, like, do you have a quiet space where he can go and he can recharge and he can sort of come back to himself? Because again, if you're that sensitive, you can get overwhelmed really easily. And as he's grown, you know, this was like when he was three, as he's grown and he's now a 10 year old, he has lots of friends and he, you know, totally gets to hang with his guy friends and he's in great shape. But it, you know, it was something that if I hadn't known about astrology, I feel like I could have really gotten worried about it. And because I did know about astrology, not only was I equipped to say, right, I mean, I expected this, but also I was empowered to say, and are you providing support, the kind of support that my child needs. And I think that that's a really helpful place for a parent to be in. Yes. How about when you didn't sort of follow your own insight and then later you realized, huh, uh uh-huh, I knew better, but I missed this chance or this opportunity. Is there a story uh, about your kids like that? Yeah, you know, the with my three year old, one of the he's so he's a Gemini and he's a double Gemini. And I was really on the fence. I my work allows me to stay at home. And my husband is also able to stay at home. So there was no huge pressure to send our youngest to like a day school a couple of days a week. And my inclination is to like keep my babies home with me, you know, as long as I can. But my youngest, he's very, very social, right? He's the, in a way, he's he's opposite his older brother. Like he loves people and he's fed by people and conversation and talking and learning. And so I was really tempted to not put him in school, in his little day school. And then, you know, when I sat down and I really looked at him, I was like, you know, it's not too early for him. Like he's raring to go. And indeed, after the first week, he was basically like, I want to go every day. And of course, he does not get to go every day. But he was, I mean, he was ready for it. So that was, that was a moment where I really could have missed it if I hadn't taken him and his particular qualities into consideration. Yeah. You also have a section about technology. Yes. Yes, I do. This came about because I have so many parent friends that, you know, we all of our children have a different relationship with technology, with screen time. And of course, coming out of the year of COVID, that took on a whole new presence in our households. And what I discovered around technology, talking about technology with my parent friends, is that it's a very fraught conversation because people are really afraid that they're going to be judged no matter what they do. Like I have friends who literally live in the woods and their kids are barefoot all of the time and they have never seen a screen. And then I have friends whose kids are on a screen 24 seven. And what I have noticed is both sides are worried equally about being judged and that they're doing something wrong. So I wanted to approach technology the same way I approach everything else 
looking at the star signs, looking at the at the, the different zodiac signs and saying, you know, for some of these children, technology is just going to be a very natural and effortless part of their life. And for others, they're going to need to watch out because it can become imbalanced. And here's what to look for. Because I really don't think that one size fits all. Just as we saw, like a lot of children had a very hard time with online learning, but then some children really thrived and flourished with online learning. So, you know, we are not one size fits all people. And I think that this is an example of that. Yeah, I I agree about that. And the person who lives in the woods with no technology, you're right. They have worries too, right? Are they doing the right thing? Or a parent whose kid is on devices the whole day, they also worry. So it's a big spectrum and no, you know, no model fits, you know, what I do in my family may not be appropriate for your family. And, And I love that you put that technology part in there too. So it's, you know, you can take into consideration your child's star sign and, and yet make a, another d- decision. Yeah. What, whatever you said about my kid is, is so right. Yeah. She is like that type of a learner, you know, mm-hmm. she, she is, and she gets things done. She, it, if it's boring, she doesn't like it. It has to be challenging, exciting. She always wants to be the number one. And we always thought maybe she's an only child. That's why. But I don't think so. You know, we don't encourage like competition, who can do it better. We, we don't have this kind of mindset in our home. But she naturally is always wants to be the winner, wants to be on top, wants to be. It's, it's the cardinal sign now that you're saying it's like, yes, it's not always about parenting, you know, right. or, or how we are. Yeah. She's born the way she's born. And oftentimes me and my husband talk about, and I say, well, she doesn't look like anything like me. Like I was not that type of a kid. As a Gemini kid, I was not this kind of a kid for sure. And we talk about this, but I come to realize that, yes, she's her own own person. And Mm -hmm. she's very different than us with her temperament, with, with all of those things, with her interests and hobbies. And it's not aligned with mine, for example. I'm a very chill person, right? Go with the flow. Mm-hmm. Let's meditate. Let's have a three-hour long conversation, you right. know, totally. a nice a nice <laughs> dinner party and, and stroll. No, nope. she let's get doing, let's play, let's throw the ball. It's very active and physical. And an interesting thing is what you said about when they're little. I found videos when she was like three, two, three, four. Oh my gosh, the energy and the excitement, the way she just, mom, let's do this. Let's do that. She dances. She, it's very, very physically active. And I remember that, that she was very physical and she's that type of a person now as, as a teenager, the opposite of me. And I always encourage my type of activities. Uh I'm like, can we journal together? Can I do this? Can we? No, she's zero interest in that. And it's very hard for me personally. Sometimes I don't get offended, but I think it's my own thing. I'm like, I wish I had a kid you know, who like journaling, who like yeah. those like soft flow, go with the flow type of activities. Right. And, you know, I have a hard time with that because it's unfamiliar for me. Mm-hmm. What would you, you know, recommend? <laughs> well, so this brings us to actually, I think one of the, the most exciting parts of the book at the very end of each chapter, there's an activity and there's a ritual. And so the activity is something you can do with your child that meets them where they are. And so it's something to share because I think when we have children that are very different than we are, the desire to share and connect is where static develops, right? Because like, this is how I connect or this is how I share. And if my child is not interested in those things, then it's kind of like, well, I I mean, I don't know, right? Like, I don't know what to do. So there's an activity. There's also a ritual. So if you want to bring a more spiritual component into it, we have a ritual. And 
we had the, the very last section before I get into the polarity is how best to connect. So I actually have a section for each of the signs that's like, this is how you can connect with this sign. A lot of times like you speak multiple languages. And so you know that a lot of times it's really about finding the right word in the right language that allows for that aha to happen, that allows for that connection to happen. And so I provide different ways and different ideas for how you can connect to each of your children. And for you and for her, like, one of the things that I think would be good would be going and doing an activity that she's interested in and then coming home or going to have lunch or something, you know, doing something that then is kind of an in-breath and you guys can talk about it. Because honestly, she's probably not ever going to really get into journaling unless she has, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, she might have like, a, you know, a bunch of like Libra or Gemini, you know, somewhere else in her chart. And, and so at some point she'll be like, I love to write, but, um, if she's like, we're, we're just talking about an, an Aries child, like journaling, she's going to be like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to sit still and do that. But she pro she would probably love to go do an activity and then talk about it with you over like a meal. That is something like, and have a conversation. That is something that she would enjoy. And Aries typically respond really well to positive encouragement as opposed to this is what you did wrong. So when the discipline section, I talk about, you know, different children, as we know, as we parents of more than one child know, different children respond to different forms of discipline in better and worse ways. And so this is something that I think is super helpful. You know, like if you have a child that is going to just take praise and do so much with it then you don't want to like be constantly scolding them and vice versa. Like if you have a child who's very much like, well, I need to know what I did wrong so I don't do it again. Then like telling them how, how great they are is not going to help them. They're going to be like, okay, that gives me no information that's useful. So I think again, it's really about finding the right language. Yeah, that, that these are good points. Yeah. And I know my daughter loves, I think all children like, of course, we have to encourage them and have a more, more positive language. That's what I talk about, you know, on the podcast, right? Because uh, we always focus on the negatives, what you did wrong, uh, what's wrong with you, why can't you do this? Uh, always criticizing, scolding. It's it's like a default, right? We're working very hard to, to be more positive. But I know for sure my daughter responds to the positive. If I say something in a critical, judgmental, scolding way, it will never get done. Yeah. <laughs> the, the task, yeah. the chores. But if I encourage or, uh, you know, believe in her, and, and this is maybe not true for everyone. I want to believe that it's true for everyone, but I know how she thrives. And she's like, mom, that was nothing. Don't worry. Like she gets very excited and she wants to do more, even more, you know, when you come from this abundance, believing in a person more positive and giving attitude as opposed to you haven't done this, you promised you, you did this, you haven't done this. You know, I, I, I don't like that mentality. I, I want to encourage people, but you're right. There are children. I have a friend who is a Virgo. She wants to know always where mm -hmm. to improve, tell me the critical part, it's okay. And she's okay with that. Yeah. You know, there are people who want to know where they failed, where they, you know, where they made a mistake uh, again, but should we be like harshly critical? We can still offer <laughs> positive feedback. It could be helpful, but not in, you don't want to praise them if they want to hear a more critical 
That's right. right, right? That's, I mean, it will actually. Otherwise, it's a, it, otherwise it's a mismatch and anxiety provoking. Like exactly different languages, right? That's what I was yeah. going to say. I mean, if you have a Virgo is a great example, and that's asking you, okay, how could I do this better? Like if you tell them, oh, it was great and it was perfect, that actually is totally going to stress them out. Like they, and they're and they're polite, and so they may not let you know that it stressed them out but it's stressing them out, you know? Whereas if you say everything was awesome except on this one thing, I think it could have been improved if da, 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 da. Then they're like, okay, great. Thank you. That's super helpful. Hey, I think offering critical uh, feedback is a skill that we can all learn. We don't have to go and offend the person, right? Or we don't have to praise, go completely the other route. If we if we can find some kind of balance. That's right. Yeah. Well, this is endlessly fascinating and exciting. So I want to be respectful of your time. Is there anything else you would like to add, say, uh, or a, a question that I didn't ask because I don't know what to ask. You know, I have my own personal interests here about the book. And also tell us where the listener can find you, where can they get the copy of the book or follow you on social media, your website? Because you have more stuff, not just, you know, the, the astrology part. Absolutely. So one more thing about the book, your audience are primarily parents. But as we know, when we work with our children, sometimes what we find is that there's a part of ourselves that needs a little bit of parenting. Maybe there was a part of ourselves that was ignored or neglected or abused growing up or just not acknowledged that needs some care and some nurturing. And so I've also included in every chapter a section on working with your inner child of that particular sign. So that may be something of interest to some of your listeners. And then you can buy the book on Amazon. Um, You can order it from the Nowhere bookstore here in San Antonio, they ship all over. And if you order it from nowhere, I can go in and I can sign it for you. So you can ask for a personalization and I can personalize it and then they'll send it to you. You can order it from any of your indie bookstores. A lot of your bookstores are going to be carrying it. Barnes and Noble has it. So basically anywhere books are sold, you can find it. And you can find me at briannasaucy.com. That's B as in boy, R-I-A-N as in no, A. S-A-U-S-S-Y dot com. And I am Brianna Saucy on Instagram and on Facebook and on Twitter. And so you can follow me at all of those places. I post daily blessings and I post astrological information pretty much on a daily basis. Um, There'll be a lot of exciting news about Star Child since we just celebrated Pub Day for this book coming out. Um, I also wrote the book Making Magic, Weaving Together the Everyday and the Extraordinary. So if you're looking for more magic um, and how to bring magic and enchantment into your life, that's a great place to start. And yes, I'm around. I'm I'm fairly available. <laughs> Great. I enjoyed connecting with you, Brianna. And I will, I think I'm following you on Instagram. I will connect with you on the socials. I will have links for the listener and your website and the bookstore in San Antonio, where my brother lives, actually. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so maybe some of the listeners who are from Texas, they can go and you know, buy the book, not Texas, from San Antonio, or if they order from there, you can sign the book. That would be a, a fun, fun treat for them. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And this was very fun, a different kind of conversation, you know, but, but I loved it. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy. That concludes today's conversation, my dear listener, and I hope you found it interesting. I would love to hear 
what your takeaways are from this episode and whether or not this episode resonated with you at all. Let's continue the conversation in our private Facebook group in the Authentic Parenting Community. And do tell me what your horoscope sign is. As you know, I'm a Gemini. For comments, questions, or feedback, please send me an email at info at authenticparenting.com. Call the number 732-763-2576 and leave a voicemail. And for international listeners, you can visit the contact page of my website, authenticparenting.com forward slash contact and access the free speak pipe tool for recording your voice message. If you enjoy the podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or by becoming a patron on patreon.com. With a small monthly contribution, you can support your favorite show and get supporter-only benefits and content. To learn more, visit patreon.com forward slash authentic parenting or simply click the link in your show notes. You can find the show and follow it wherever podcasts are played, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and elsewhere. And you can connect with me on Instagram, the only social media platform that I use. Until next week, connect to the present moment, to yourself and your children. I am Anna Seewald. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.